So we have a lot to discuss um, today. And uh, let's just start with why strong typing is important and why it should be important um, for your projects. And I mean, we are close to this place. And I think this example just neatly sums it up. <laughs> right? <laughs> Sum it up. That's it. That's the motivation. Okay. So, <laughs> um, you know, all of those are ints. They just added them together. No compiler warnings whatsoever. But where I'm coming from is actually my room at home two years ago when C++ now was not here. And then I was presenting uh, about a static analysis rule which detected um, implicit conversions and all other nice things that can go wrong when you are designing a function. And without going into too much detail, there's a lot you can read and watch about the, that uh, research and implementation effort. But to sum it up is that we have created a static analysis rule in particular, this is done with Clank Tidy, which looks at your functions, the ones that you've written, and tells you, you know, your users will make a big mistake here because even though this says class ID here, this also just means int. And you know, if I'm inside the compiler, I can detect that. But what's more interesting is that we found that most of these problems come with or I come from the built-in types. So the big blue bars at the bottom of the chart is the percent of how much of all these swaps, like potential swaps in the, in the function signatures, come from the built-in types. Now, of course, this analysis rule is really great. It doesn't crash. The only problem is that it gives you a lot of results. <coughs> And I hope you can see this is, this is running it on LLVM itself in the most verbose configuration. And it gave you 7,300 um, 7, results. Hands up if you would like to go ahead and fix all of them. All right, for the record, I see, okay, I, I see half a hand, okay. Now, there were some very nice <coughs> and positive reactions to this uh, analysis rule. In particular, uh, we were mentioned in CPPcast and Jason Turner in his uh, book that you can download uh, of, from some like indie publishing website, um, mentions the checker directly. And the quote is verbatim from the CPPcast. They said that it sounds extremely helpful but that's different from what people who had to uh, reply to the results did. And unfortunately, it turns out that I, I went on GitHub and searched for all the mentions of, of my check, and it turns out that the vast majority of people were negative about it. Maybe not 7,000 results, but they did not intend to fix it. So today, while this does look like from the abstract, the tool demo. I would rather move this to some sort of a, a design question kind of discussion because I say it now, I don't have a completely working tool with me. And instead of focusing on functions and parameter passing, let's just focus on everything that we can uh, <coughs> have in the language. So what is strong typing? Because this is maybe not that well defined across the industry and you know every place every every school has a different view of that now when i talk about strong typing i mean something like this so instead of using the built-in types in particular let's just use types that express the domain and the value that they want to express okay so i want to move from what's on the top um, where, you know, we are just using int to something on the bottom. And I'm purposefully not talking in the context of, you know, having three integers in the same function and you can swap them around kind of thing. That was the previous talk. 
Now, the cheapest way to get to this is something that's called a strong type def, or in some other languages, it, it's called a new type. Since C11, you can go explicit with your conversions. And while there are a bunch of ways you can then read the value from the wrapper object, while it is verbose, it does fix the parameter swapping problem. And in good, you know, don't pay what you don't pay for what you don't use a uh, way of thinking. If you do enable optimizations, then the compiler will see through it all. You know, there are no colored lines on the top for the struct definitions. Now, this is very good, but very verbose. So maybe we can go a step further. And the step further is where most of the existing libraries went, which we'll look at in a brief moment, where on top of the wrapper type, you have some sort of operations defined. So the user is not doing the unboxing, the multiplication, and the reboxing. You hide it in the library. And this is where I call it strong interface, just to differentiate from let's say, more true strong types like chrono, um, where I hope it's known to, to most people that we have semantics and, in, uh, encoded into the operations. So it's not just that we can map it to mathematics. You can do stuff like this, where it will understand the dimension and then give you some appropriate results expressed in the right granularity. And it also prevents um, mistakes at function arguments. Now, the interesting thing about wrapper types is that in some case, they can give you a negative overhead at runtime, which, is, which was pretty surprising when I first looked at it. So um, I know that in the physical world, the slides is a, are a bit small, but Basically, what I have here is some aliasing at the top. And then I calculate the division of some potentially aliased uh, value. And if I don't do optimizations, then the codes are, and on the bottom, I have the same, but with the wrapper types. And without optimizations, the code is much longer. But if I do turn on optimizations, some clever compilers can realize that C++ forbids aliasing um, between types that are not the same, for example, a wrapper for a, a numerator and a denominator. And it will optimize out all the calculation and just tell you that 512 divided by 42 is 12, you know, round it down. Now I say some clever compilers do this. Some other compilers, unfortunately, did not. but these are always improving, so why not use this? Now, just for some further lookout, apart from Chrono, we have a lot of other libraries which, with which you can achieve strong types. For example, Mateusz uh, presented this in 2019. I think it was in this very room, actually. Um, and as far as I know, this is on track for getting into the standard, or <coughs> I heard something like that. Mm -hmm. So the same deal like Chrono, but for physical units. Mm -hmm. Or you can do some more uh, <coughs> algebraic uh, things where you have to be a bit verbose with your definitions, but you can do the strong interface in a more, how to say, like a, a more verbose but, but clear-cut manner. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, um, for specific domains, you can have automations that can do the transformation for you. I'm not going to go into detail of all of them. You can read the papers and, and watch the presentations. I think this, I think I accidentally cited the research paper, but I'm sure Hiram presented that CPPCon <coughs> or something like that about this. Now, OK, that's all good. We have libraries that we can use. But how do we use them? So let's assume that you have your project already working and very good. And you have come across some strong typing library that you would 
like to use and it, it seems to fit your purpose. And now you want to do the refactoring. And this is where it gets a bit weird because you have a working version of your code. Okay, it's a bit more elaborate version of that temperature calculation, climate control, whatever program, very contrived example. So you first decide, okay, I want to do some temperature type here. You define the strong wrapper. I mean, strong wrapper? This is not yet the strong wrapper. So first you just go, okay, I want a wrapper. Don't go strong yet, just I want a wrapper. And now you can do rewrite your code. So the stuff on the left is the existing code as it's getting rewritten. The stuff on the right is the brand new code that you need to write um, in addition. So, okay, you rewrote this. Now there are implicit conversions everywhere. So what do you do? You make your conversions explicit, which now gives you a compiler. And I, I come from a team we work with the Clang compiler and we implement new checkers. So the moment I have a compile error, I'm, I'm out of here. So I can't do anything. If the code does not parse, I cannot do refactorings. I cannot do analysis. I, I, I can't do anything. So we don't want this. And you also don't want this because once the code doesn't compile, you are at the mercy of the compiler. How much more errors could it detect before giving up? Okay. This is a small example. Let's just rewrite it to be temperature in some more places. Now it's getting a bit more comfortable. You know, we are no longer using any sort of int variable to represent temperatures. And now we want to do something with the threshold function. So I'm multiplying with the scalar. I'm not sure if I want to do that, but Let's say you want to do that. You have to introduce an operator for that, um, which you do as a global function because you cannot add member functions to int. And you do all the calculation inside. Now, is this strong typing? Like, now we are going back to ints. Maybe you want to do this, maybe you don't. Uh, these are all questions you have to do when you are doing such a refactoring. And this refactoring can go further because, you know, you can replace macros and literals with enums with well-defined values. And now that you have changed this, you have to think about the print function. And if we assume you have a more proper printing function, not the newest and flashiest format library, but let's just go back to IOStream. Now you will have a kind of error on the right, which is telling you that there is no way to convert temperature to something printable, and then you get this. <laughs> and why this, like why? And then you have to scroll up five or 10 screens worth of height to get back to the error message. Okay, so this is what the, the proper word for this kind of operation is called type migration. And all the existing approaches, which you could do, they either worked for a very small specific subset of a domain, like for example, <coughs> time refactorings for, for the app sale library, or I don't know, nothing else comes to mind, but that, that works in Clang tidy for the app sale library. And if you wanted to do generic refactorings, you still needed to define your own mapping. You had to have all the new types you want to use already designed. And that meant that you had to understand either your entire project in advance, which is harder than it sounds, or you had to accept that somewhere you will just run into a compiler. And as I said, if the compiler gives up because your code is not proper anymore. Virtually all tools that can do this just stop working. And it's really funny because we, we come back to this. This is from 2019, also 10th of May, just it was a Friday back then. This was a talk I gave about modules. And before that, I asked, you know, tell me, guess, tell me a guess how much C++ code is out there back at the time not using modules. And, you know, I got numbers like this, very big numbers. 
common C++ code is out there not using strong types. Okay, we are back here again. So, let's say you don't have those. You don't have, you either don't have the library yet, or even if you do have the library, you don't have the mapping. Because it's reasonable to assume that you did not see through your code for all the operations that you would ever want to use on your types. But you could have some tools, okay? Now let's see what happens now. So um, this will be an overview of a tool that I've been creating for the past two years, maybe. There will be a slide about the timeline at the end, but okay, let's go. Let's see how it works. So I've created a small snippet from the previous example. So we have some uh, temperature that we are loading somehow. It's not interesting for the purposes of this uh, um, exposition. I'm giving it over to a function. I want to calculate, you know, how much three times the temperature is. And then I want to say it's a temperature. And if you are a compiler person, uh, you are likely used to these things on the right. It's called an abstract syntax tree. Just a nice little graph view of how the compiler thinks about your code. So what can you do now? Okay, I don't, I, I know, looking at this code, that this is a temperature. I want to use, the, use a temperature. But maybe I don't know that I want to be able to scale a temperature or co compare a temperature. So what I say, I tell the tool, this variable should be a temperature. And I, I call this method fictive types. Mm -hmm. We will go into why it's called like that. This is just an annotation, okay? So you put this in here, and I will abbreviate it as FT for you know, the size on the, on the screen. And the really great thing about attributes, although I did hear some a corridor talk about this earlier, is that by default, compilers only warn or completely ignore an attribute they, don't, they do not recognize. This is great. Now I can put whatever I want into C++ code <coughs> using attributes, you know, as long as I don't use unhandled Unicode characters or whatever like that, but I can make my tool understand it. So this is, if you run this code with just a usual stock official released compiler, it will give a warning, we can ignore warnings, but then I can run a tool which does understand this annotation. So back to the example, now the tool can see that you have colored that thing to be temperature. And now it can go further and it, it will go through out your translation unit and into other translation units saying that, okay, you are passing a temperature to this function. If I want this function to work with temperatures instead of ints, then this function will need to take temperature. So it colors that one. And now I have another piece of information and I can go further. And now I can see that inside that um, multiplication, you are using a temperature. And now I can tell you something very interesting. Okay. Now, what happens is that I can realize that you are doing an operation between types that are not yet um, readily known. And I can give you some advice. Okay, you either have to define this operation to work with, you know, bare types or built-in types, or you have to make sure that the other value in that multiplication is also, a, it also has a fictive type annotation, which gives it a, a well-defined, I wouldn't want to say concept because C plus plus 20 reserved that name, but like, like a, a well, well understandable meaning behind it. This is what was the compile error before, but realize this time, this is not a compile error. I still have a perfectly valid syntax tree on the right. Everything works outside this tool as well, but I can act on this information. And um, just because we are going for strong types here, what I did, I factor out that, that number for technical reasons we will get into, and then I restart the execution. 
those bits of information are still in the code. So now the syntax tree changed a little bit. And this time, if I say, you know, this is a factor. So let's allow scaling up a temperature because that makes sense in your particular domain. Now, if I said that I understand this operation, I can calculate further and say, okay, so factor times temperature is a temperature. Now, then this function returns a temperature and then that variable becomes a temperature. See? Now, just imagine this for all the other constructs in the world in the language and in a long going iteration for a large project. Okay, mm. why did I do all this? Now I have littered the code full of these annotations, which other people on your team may or may not want to read. But the fact of the matter is, uh, even if you committed these changes to some working branch or some side track of refactoring effort, if I forget about them, this is still perfectly valid C++. This is why uh, choosing annotations for most of the, the signaling in this, in this system was good because I can just still use it as C++ code before I'm, I'm done with the refactoring. But once I decide that I've saturated my code enough to go and use the new strong type, I can just decide to press the button. And first I can have the strong wrappers <coughs> generated on the top, and then I can rewrite the code. Okay, I'm a bit hand-waving here how it happens, but this is what we want. I mean, hopefully get rid of all the, the weak types that do not express conceptual meaning behind them. And now, while this is also, again, perfect, almost perfectly fine C++ code, every compiler that's, what's the right word, conformant to the standard, they can give me a proper error message that I am doing multiplication between factor and temperature, and that operation does not exist. And you can imagine this with every other kind of combinations, function, calls. They can catch your mistake in the future. But of course, I lied a little bit here because what I did is I forgot to generate the definition for the operation. I told the tool beforehand that I know its meaning. Okay, this is the overview. Any questions so far? How, how does the attribute uh, thing work with like type? Uh, uh, like, um, can we specify that we know this attributes to the compiler with mm. or? Um, can we specify if we know the attribute? Um, in practice, I had to modify the compiler. So right now I have a version of Clang which, which has some additional piece of code inside that makes it recognize this attribute. And then my tool can consume the modified uh, semantic output where these additional attributes are present in binary form in the in the memory of the compiler. So unfortunately this is a caveat that you have to actually modify the compiler. It's not like Java annotations which you can define in, in uh, like um, actual code in the project. <coughs> so um, the model is written in a scientific paper. It's Interesting to look at, but uh, it's just describing in prose what I described in, in, this, uh, in the presentation. So maybe we can go and see why I'm calling it fictive types and, and what does this all mean. So um, it's a transitional fuel. All these, all these attributes do not stay in your code. They are not meant to stay in your code. It's only there for the purpose of, of signaling uh, the decision points. And so far, the, they express a strict set membership. So if I say fictive type temperature, then the variable that's annotated should represent the temperature. There is no inheritance. There is no overloading, nothing like that. And, um, Maybe that's not a good thing, but so far this is the model that we've been working with. 
So you can write things like that in the green box. Uh, anywhere you can put an attribute, you can just put this one. It takes something that looks like a string and that does not have any semantic value to the tool. It just takes it from you uh, in an absolute trust. You want this type to happen. Temperature, speed, whatever you go, you, whatever you want. Now, interestingly, what, what would it mean if I do this? So there is one variable, but it has two separate fictive types. How, how would you refactor this to existing C++ language elements? Hmm? Hmm? Any idea? Multiple inheritance. Multiple inheritance. Interesting. Actually, my, my idea with this was to do a variant. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you might end up realizing that the same, let's say the real type representing the, the binary representation of, of some value represents stuff from multiple domains. And maybe you want that. And then perhaps this way you can express it. But the more yeah. important part of this is if you would write this. The, the blue and the red is not the same. The blue is one fictive type that's constituent of multiple, once again, I don't want to say concept, but you know, that's no better word in English for this. The bottom one is the same variable having two separate fictive type annotations reaching it. And now that I'm talking about reaching, maybe taint analysis comes to mind for the more security inclined for folks. And how taint analysis comes to mind is that there are all these static analysis systems where you can go and find tainted data, untrusted data reaching places where it shouldn't. And taint analysis is usually context sensitive. It's usually done with data flow and data flow has a very large literature behind it, but it's interested in the value behind the variable. So an integer could be tainted or could be not tainted. The same integer variable on one pass could be tainted if it's read from the user. And on another pass, it could be clear or clean or safe or I don't know, untainted. Whereas this model wants to do a more type interested part where I want to make sure that this variable always means the same thing. But interestingly, and this, this actually was suggested to me by a colleague, maybe if you know taint analysis, it would be good to see an example of how this model might be able to express it. So I have some very, very bad code on the slide here, okay? I read some parts from the user and I open it. Tell me which file to open, I will do everything for you with it. And if we suppose that some clever people uh, decided to ensure in the fictive type domain that the reading operator gives me some tainted stuff, but I shouldn't open a path that, you know, I should only open, pa only open five passes that are not tainted, then let's see what the two would do. So first off, we realize that we are using this operator, the read operator into that buffer. And because the read operator function says that the buffer is a potentially tainted value, I can reverse propagate this information out to the variable in main. So it appeared there. And now if this is here, I can forward propagate from the local variable onto the function signature. And then this will happen. I will have a function that wants to take the types from two separate domains. And then I can, I can signal an error to the user. So this is why having two separate attributes is an error. Why having an attribute with multiple um, 
identifiers inside is not an error. Now, there are a lot of places you can write attributes uh, in the C++ grammar. So maybe this is not the official syntax for attributes. I, I think just like C um, function pointers and whatnot, they should go on the right. Yes? Yeah. <clears throat> So, you, so there are a lot of them. Do you have you seen a definitive explanation of them all? There, it, it, it of course is described in the standard, but that's pretty hard to grok um, and get. Like, here's where it, here's where you put it for these variables and with, you know because mm. they can bind. They have different bindings depending on where you put them. Um, <clears throat> no, I I don't think I saw a comprehensive list of where mm -hmm. attributes. Like, like you know, a, a human readable list of where attributes might appear. I think CPP reference does have a good collection for it, but generally it's always in the grammar like etter, spec, opt, blah blah blah. But 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 generally they can always appear on 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 symbol declarations mostly, and this will be important for a few reasons because. There are some contexts where, we, where I would really like to have this attribute in the code, but I can't. And one of these contexts is literal values. You, you can't like put the attribute within an expression near a literal value and be able to consume it later. <coughs> and you also cannot write, you, you also cannot have in your hands a function that is executed over a built-in type. So even though I can conceptually think about adding two integers and discussing what happens if one of those integers is, a fictive, is fictively typed, I, I cannot say this in the source code. So even though attributes are pretty great for in-band signaling, I had to introduce some configuration <coughs> files. And basically what I have in the tool is this uh, Operation map expressed in YAML format because YAML was the, the cheapest and easiest to consume within LLVM because we have our own YAML implementation there. Only for the reason that you cannot express what operations are valid over fictively typed versions of some int, I have this file where you can do this. So what this says is that if you ever, in, if, dear tool, if you ever encounter operator minus between two temperatures that are wrapping built-in types, int or double or something like that, then consider as if the function returning that temperature difference t existed and calculate with that. So when I said in the previous section that you have this um, factor times temperature equals temperature, which I, I record somewhere. Th this is that somewhere, basically. And you can do a lot of things here. Just again, the name of the type doesn't matter because this is a strict, <coughs> this is a strict MI part of this conceptual idea of a value uh, kind of thing. But you can write this kind of, um, <coughs> Let me just go back there, actually. Um, so, so the part on the top. So this part here is what goes into the, to the configuration file. <clears throat> OK. So now that we have this, what do I have here at the bottom? If we ignore the ability to fictively type user-defined types, because that's also perfectly possible, not just ints. I have a strong interface. During the propagation of the fictive types within my project, during having to mark all the nodes that should become temperature and speed and whatnot, the two forced me to design my new types. So instead of having to do this in advance to understand my project, if it's a large enough project, the tool made me understand it. And 
uh, this format, I, I had a, a student who, as his bachelor thesis, implemented a strong type library generator, which takes a format in YAML much like the one my tool is using, a little bit different, but I hope you can imagine a, a, a bidirectional mapping between the two. So once from the file that we have created during the traversal of your project, I could generate this other uh, schema, or maybe I can just improve that tool and have it consume my file directly. But this here is the strong interface, just not written in C++. But if I run the tool, uh, it can generate header-only libraries. It can generate um, conventional libraries that have CPP files in them. It doesn't support modules, unfortunately, but maybe we will come to that later. But from this YAML file, you can automatically generate, if you are so inclined, the the strong interface. It will be really verbose. I actually had to cut out a few things from the slide to make it, um, from the code to make it fit, fit on the slide. <clears throat> but this is the same stuff we saw from before from, from Peter Sommerlad's library, just created with a tool. Now you can go to two roads from here. Either you have this code generation always part of your build, build process. Okay, so if you don't care that, um, so if you don't want to, staying in the physics domain, if you don't want to transform values between ratios and stuff like that, you could just have this, this definition file with your project and every time you build it, just have your build system generate the library for you. But what's more interesting is that once we have it, um, if you have invariants, like you know, you don't want to express speed quicker than the speed of light, or you don't want to express negative temperature or something like that, you can add your assertions in here. You can add whatever. This is you know C++ code. You can write whatever you want in here. Now, I hope you are a bit excited that this is a very great tool, right? So. Now I can fix everything that's wrong with implicit conversions and all my function signatures will be safer and no one will make a mistake ever again, <laughs> except that this is C++. So we have, so I started working on this too and, and, and we will see it um, on screenshots later, but I have run into more constructs in the language and the way people write code, not because they are evil, but out of necessity, then I can count where this very nice model that I've described before just breaks apart completely. It, it looks so good. You just fork the compiler, make it have two attributes that it can consume, and then you write something that's on the size of like five clank tidy checks and it just does it all for you, right? Ah, uh, no. So where can it go wrong? Um, there are a bunch of constructs during refactoring that you, you just shouldn't touch. Maybe you are not allowed to, such as the case of virtually all and every library that your project uses, okay? If I am consuming your CPP file that includes IOStream, that includes UniSTD, that includes uh, Boost, Metashell, or whatever, I will see those functions in your, in your code as I'm the compiler. But I cannot start adding these attributes into files that, um, that is not in your legal possession. And in fact, the last time I checked, uh, it would be perfectly valid for a C++ compiler, at least up to CPP 17 pre-modules, that if you say uh, pound include vector, to not search for a file named vector on the disk, it would be perfectly fine for the compiler to inherently know what vector means and give it to you. 
And then what file I'm writing, even if I'm root and could touch the, the, the standard library on the disk, if it is not on the disk. Okay, so this is C++. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times um, we are touching uh, C APIs and calling into C code. You know, POSIX, um, you are doing JPEG transformations, you are doing cryptographic calculations, stuff like that. I cannot refactor it because all the nice stuff of strong types with constructors, with custom operators, with, <coughs> with um, I don't know, what else can a, can a class give you? Vis uh, member visibility and whatnot. You cannot express that in C, okay? So now I need to know if that, that stuff you are calling is, in fact, even if it's your code and I would legally be allowed to touch it, is it C code or not C code or, or the kind of C code where you are only using C to turn off the name mangling, but in practice it's perfectly legal to give a shared pointer into it because I did C code like that, uh -huh, C code. So it's extern C just to have a non-mangled name, but you are giving it a boost program option and you are taking a shared pointer from it, but it's defined as a C function, all right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then there is something that I, I, I try to be very funny and call it the, the very generic of generics. So, I mean, this is C++ now, but so far the examples have been very much CPP 98. So, so there are a few cases where being too eager to move away from a, a generic type. And in this context, I'm saying int is a generic type because it's just a number, right? We break down. And <clears throat> this means that you want to respect some boundaries, even within the project, because you know you, you want to first make sure that some smaller library is safer before doing it for the whole project altogether. Of course, the, the external boundary of the project should be a very hard limit. And all these propagations that I've shown earlier, they are very much eager to over approximate and we want to control it. So I added one attribute to the compiler already. So maybe I can show a few more. So as I said, there are a lot of external code we are using day to day, which I should not touch. So if I'm writing out an int, I shouldn't. Um, okay, maybe you can overload the, the, the feed operator, but, but maybe that you can do that. You definitely can do that in IOStream. stream. You could give your own overload. There is Erno, that's the nicest of the C APIs that I could come up with. You, you shouldn't really refactor Erno into an enum, even though it's pretty much considered an enum, especially in, in C++, if you are using std error code and error category and all that kind of stuff. And you really don't want to change a generic function like vector t pushback. So if I want to push cats into a vector, I don't want every vector t pushback to take cats instead of t's, I want a vector of cats, right? So I also can change that function signature. So I added one, <coughs> I added one attribute into the compiler already. So why, why shouldn't I add like five more, I think? <laughs> um, it's an open-ended list. So, okay, I want you to be able to say, okay, tool, this is where you stop. And for this reason, we've created an ignore attribute, which just says, um, you shouldn't touch this. You are not refactoring this symbol ever. And because I know what's not part of your project, or I can approximate this fact, um, everything in the standard library is ignored. Everything coming from a system header is ignored, blah, blah, blah. And what this means is that if you have this refactoring effort going, we are back to temperatures. I want to print out the temperature. If I am not allowed to touch the output operator for, for all stream, 
then I have to leave the nice domain, the strong type domain here. And the tool can do this for you. Um, it realizes that that function is ignored and then just inserts the cast. Okay. Um, much of this is just explo uh, exploratory. So there are cases this isn't working in practice, but this is the model at least. So you can do this, okay? Here I am explicitly leaving the nice domain. And this is post refactoring because this thing here became a temperature already. Now, um, alternatively, you, you have a better point where you can create a barrier. So we have this attribute, attribute barrier, which says that, okay, so it's, it's like an ignore, but just, I'm still refactorable, just ignore everything after me, okay? So in this case, um, T2 becomes temperature because it's initialized from another would-be temperature. And what comes, and every other use case of T2 that without the barrier would propagate this taint further, does not. And then the cost is inserted there. Okay, this can get ugly because um, if I'm casting away the strong type every single time, I'm using a library that does not respect my strong type, then I will have a code where every second word in it will be static cast mm -hmm. like this. Okay, so. Okay, of course, there is a double version for the print operator. Everything gets rewritten back into costs. So I'm the compiler still. So I can do, understand some more things about the code. And instead, so I want the strong interface. Okay, so there is the strong type def, the strong interface and the strong type. Um, Explicit conversion, operators, chrono. Isn't printing a temperature perhaps part, part of its strong interface? If we assume that you are representing everything in one specific unit of measure, then maybe you would want to be able to print temperatures in a way that the unit itself gets printed to the output if you are printing to text. So instead, what we could say is that I want the tool that if I am passing something fictively typed on the second parameter, do not cast outside. Give me a version of the function that does the casting inside. Okay, strong interface. Without strong interfaces, you would first go back to the row type, do the operation, wrap it into the strong type again. Width.get times height dot get, and then you pass it into the constructor of an area. Instead, for some very specific cases, and this printing stuff is the, the most uh, prominent of them all, I could do hide the cast from the user. And now the user gets a much nicer API. They can just print the temperature, and it will still do, it will still do the right thing inside, just their code won't be full of casts everywhere. Hmm. Okay. This is starting to get real nice now. So I am generating a bunch of new functions. I am not touching the standard library. You are still getting what you want, but you know, you are full of casts and everything. But there is a point, and this is where, this is C++ comes into play again that there are a few very generic functions. And <coughs> in this context, I do not mean generics in the language. Um, not, I don't mean generics, generic from a language perspective, so I don't mean templates. I mean an implementation of a generic idea. So if I have a bunch of strong versions of a number, temperature, speed, I don't know, elevation, blah, blah, blah. They are still comparable 
right? I can ask what is the warmest temperature. I can ask which is the highest elevation, which one is the fastest car, stuff like that. So the max function, if we imagine that there would be a max function specifically defined just for int, to, to not get into the template part of things, what would happen if I have two temperatures, I want to take their maximum, OK? Right now, without the attribute, I am taking the maximum of two ints. I'm getting an int. It's all fine. In my mind, they are temperatures. So I want a max function that takes two temperatures and gives me back a temperature. But if I only use the um, tool, the parts of the tool that I've just shown, I will run into problems. <coughs> because if I don't do anything um, and just let the tool go, it will see that you are passing temperature for the first and the second parameter. And if you don't call temperature, or sorry, if you don't call max with any other fictive type, it will replace the max function with a version that takes temperatures. If you call max with speed in the same propagation or for the same refactoring effort, it will tell you that you are passing a speed to a temperature and give you an error. Like back in the example, you are passing some untrustworthy value to F open, which expects a sanitized input. You are not opening files, the user just tells you to open. And what's worse is that maybe we won't even see the fact that it does return a temperature from within. I mean, hopefully we can see the implementation for this, but if we don't see the implementation for this, the existing uh, toolkit breaks down. Now, if we ignore, if we say that max is coming from the standard library, and we say that it is implicitly ignored, or you have your own function and you explicitly mark it as ignored, then OK, the moment I'm trying to call temperature, I will be safe in a way that it won't touch my very generic, generic function. It will litter my code with casts as expected from ignore, but I lose the information that the maximum of two temperatures is still a temperature. That's maybe not what we want. <clears throat> so um, this is a really interesting idea that, that we had because um, part, of my, my, the part of the team that I, I work in, we work with the Clank Static Analyzer and we were working on cross translation unit analysis. And it was a huge contention between two, let's say two, two sides of the river, whether we want summaries for the analysis or we want actual inlining of function bodies from, from ASTs and loading and whatnot. And it gave me the idea, OK, so if I see the body of a function and I have these very well-defined families of use cases, for example, the max function, why can't I just inline the idea that the maximum of two temperatures is still a temperature. And this made me add another attribute to the code, which is once again transitional. So this does not have to stay in your code forever, more like it shouldn't. Um, so if I see the body of the max function, and it, it, it usually looks something like this, I hope, um, then so if, if b is larger than a, then return b. OK, so it, it is a max function, all right. Um, so I can look at just the definition of the function if I see it. And maybe as a tool, I can generate some summaries. And in fact, what I had implemented before is two types of summaries, or two kinds of summaries for functions. The one is the type of two parameters should be the same. And the other is that the return type should be the same as one of the parameter types. So in fact, from the max function, I can deduce three 
summaries that I've unified out to that equation, that if I pass in two temperatures, that's fine, but the return type has to be that. So int, 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 temperature, 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 speed, 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 whatever, but not temperature, speed, and the max of that is elevation. That just doesn't make sense. And if I do this, um, then post refactoring, what we will have is the max function stays the same. It does not get transformed. It's still working on ints, but the tool itself will see through it and show you that indeed the resulting value of, of calling the max function on two temperatures can be and should be put inside another temperature. Unfortunately, you still have to have the cast, so you have to make, uh, you, or you have to do that. That one of the conversions away from the strong type is possible implicitly. Question. Yes. This static cast has a cost, or they are eliminated? Where the uh, the <coughs> they are. They they are they are without cost. Um, can I do it like I'm go to a specific slide or? Uh, okay, I can just go back and then maybe go forward, it's quicker like that. They, they are without cost. Mm -hmm. So um, here is the, the, the trivial example where I don't have operations. I just had explicit constructor and then explicit, like explicit boxing, explicit unboxing. This is possible built in in Haskell, it's called new type. Um, and without optimizations, you see that there are colored lines for the structs. That means that those functions exist in the, in the generated uh, binary. But if I enable optimizations, then the compiler will see through the fact that uh, you are just using whatever first four bytes of that memory location where the struct lives and let go of all the function calls. Um, I think I can click on the, I can click here. Oh, nice. Okay. So any further questions? because uh, this has been the part where I described the model, but even though I have been saying that, you know, part of this doesn't work, part of this looks ugly, part of this is exploratory, I do have working tools, so, yes? I have another question. So when you, when you translate the program, like mm -hmm. the strong typing, uh, does it happen that the, <clears throat> this new version of the program is faster? the original, since you don't have the problem of aliasing of references and things like that? It can so happen. Less, less it, it can happen. It can happen, so yes. It can be more efficient. So yes, more. yes, yes. But that's that's true, that's true mm -hmm. just from the strong aliasing rule, if you yeah. adhere to it. But that alone is... Like yeah, it's, it's, it's really nice. Um, it, it can optimize it away that you don't have to reload. and. And I think that more complex examples where you can get rid of aliasing would get even more optimal, especially in the case of, of arrays and, and, and stuff like that. Like if you have multiple arrays, then you can, they, it can optimize the memory layout a little bit better, but truth be told, I'm a front-end person. So <laughs> I, 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 I know how the backend part of the compiler works, but I never wrote optimizing logic myself and stuff like that. So, so let's look at how this whole tool looks like. Okay, so how does it look like in practice? So as I said, there was a bit of a, a timeline towards the end of my slides. Um, unfortunately, I've been working on this all by myself. So I, I wasn't really being fast with it, and I did have a lot of other duties to attend to, um, especially as a PhD student, like writing academic papers and stuff like that. But basically, after finishing up the research into the parameter passing problem, which is officially part of Clank Tidy, if you get the warning, bug prone, easily swappable parameters, then get it after I'm not here, and then you can blame me. can't blame me. <laughs> But basically, uh, end of 2021, I did have the tool working for C. But I realized that it just won't scale because the fixed point iteration was done within the compiler. And, you know, 
LLVM takes one and a half hours to compile on this machine. And if I fix point iterate one and a half hours in every round, then, you know, that's just not going to work. So why C? This is C++ now. So why am I talking about, about C stuff? This is why. Uh, the most of the unsafety of function interfaces and weaknesses comes from the built-in types. And this chart has a lot of terminology on it, but basically what this means is, it, this is the results of the, of the previous talk, of, the, of that previous analysis effort. Um, CVI means that, so, so the S here means strictness. It just means that int int is convertible, int and double isn't. CVI means that I show implicit conversions. Int and cons double is convertible. You can fine tune how much warnings you want to get. And this slash RF means that int and cons double are convertible, but if you are comparing them within the function body, don't do a warning. So only compare distinct parameters that are not used together within the function. Okay, watch the previous talk, it's explained more in detail. But the more I go towards implicit conversions and the more I filter out whatever I can can with static analysis, the higher the relative power for the unsafety of built-in types. Int, car, double, bool, all these things. And they come from C, so I mean, if, if, if I work for C constructs and stop where C++ begins, then I can already win a lot. So <laughs> following that, a lot of uh, engineering effort went into making sure the tool scales better. And um, it was in 2020 spring that, that one of my, my students was uh, working on this thesis for the code generation. So this whole thing starts with a working build, just like IDEs. I'm sure since 2019, ClangD is perhaps a bit more popular. You need to have a compilation database. I need to know your flags. Um, I'm coming from the talk previously about modules. No, I haven't thought about modules this time. So you have one, comp one set of compilation flags for each time, okay? One compiler, everything is fine. Uh, what was the name of the previous person, just for the record? The one who gave the module talk, previous session? D David or Daniel? Daniel Russo. Daniel Russo. Daniel Russo, okay, so watch it if you interested in why you can't have one set of flags, but this time you have one set of flags. I need your code to compile. <laughs> so if you have generated code, please have run the build. I, I want it to, to be in a compilable state. And then you can add this initial taint with the attributes. As I said, this is transitional, but the usual compiler ignores them. So you can add this to version control, which is really nice. And you can, you can also, you should also give me this configuration file with the operations of the built-in types. And I think there will be a few more like configuration that cannot be ex expressed within C++. But this is also a file that you can version. Can be part of code review if you want. And then I have, I have implemented this in Clang. So this is now called Clang fictive types. Uh, you can just have a, a driver program, you just give it the compilation database and then it goes as far as it can. Or if you can, uh, <coughs> you want to do it manually, then there are three steps, correct three steps, as shown in the previous section with the, the, the coloring of the graph that corresponds to the execution of three tools. First, I need to get the propagations from your code into some magic binary file that is more optimal to read than doing the parsing over and over and over again. And then I, do, I need to do the iteration and then I can do the rewriting of the code. So just three tools, the top one just runs them in this sequence basically. So let's suppose some very contrived example of a, a dummy project where I have two translation units, just to show that this, thanks to headers, this does indeed work across translation units, where <coughs> I'm basically just giving you three times arc C, right? Yeah, it goes into calc. So 
So I have RC here, it goes into calc. Calc doesn't really do anything with it, so it comes back. So X is RC, and this is just three times RC, just written like this, okay? So, um, I can't increase the font size, unfortunately, these are screenshots. So if I'm just, you know, in some directory, I can show that indeed the files are there, which were <coughs> on the previous slides. Now you know that I made this example about a month ago. I create a compilation database because I didn't want to deal with CMake. I just did code checker log. Now I have a compilation database, which is really not interesting, but just shows you, you know, these two files were compiled. <coughs> and um, it does the right thing. Okay, so I have six arguments there, uh, and indeed it gives you three times six just to prove that it works. Now, I do, the, I run the tool, single-threaded, because I, I don't, it, multi -thread it doesn't look good if you have a bunch of output messages, and it seems to do something. Okay, so there are some timestamps on the top. There is some structure here that has different sizes, so it, it looks convincing that it's real. <laughs> and then, and then at the bottom, it just tells you nothing changed. Hmm. Yeah, okay, but this is what you wanted. I, I didn't put any fictive type annotation into the code. I just ran it on the project without touching it. So indeed, in one iteration, it realized that it doesn't have to do anything. <clears throat> but it works. You know, testing empty input, one input, two input, five input, infinite input, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's do something more interesting than empty input. So now, as a developer of this really contrived project, just, you know, they had to put together some language elements to show that tool. I go into the program, change the file, and I add one annotation in there, here. So I'm just calling it test type because, you know, this is just some contrived example, but now what I'm saying, X, is a test type that wraps int. Okay, what happens now? Now, because I changed the file, I could run the, the high-level tool, but just to show that, you know, small, it, it is composed of smaller operations. I rerun the collection phase. Now it's showing me that it's um, actually, the interesting <coughs> bit is here. Type names were zero, okay? Zero elements, which can be represented by zero bytes. Now, type's name is 14. And I guess test underscore type plus an old terminator plus, I don't know, some checksum is 14, okay? So something changed. Um, and indeed, this whole magic data file is just a bunch of binary stuff that you don't have to see for yourself, but just to show that somewhere in there, I think test type roundabout at the third in line 220 hex, it's test type written in there. So it, it, it's so that you did this change. And now I can start the propagation. And so far, what I have implemented is only forward propagation. So I said X is a test type. Now, naturally, this can go in two directions. Every use of X will have to understand how to do it with test types. But if I'm constructing a test type from some expression, then maybe it's reasonable to assume that I also want that expression to be at least convertible to a test type. So if I'm doing um, X equals calc whatever, then I would like to say that calc returns a test type but reverse propagation is not implemented in this new, new rewrite of the tool yet. But it, it's a thing in theory that reverse propagation is possible. So now it starts doing the propagation. It does nothing on libcpp because there is no reverse propagation. But on main, it finds an error. I'm not sure why it said twice that error was signaled, but it finds an error. And it is what was on the, on the model slide. Like, I don't have it defined what test type plus test type means. 
And because I'm inside the compiler, I can show you nice error messages similarly to how the clan compiler for the usual C and C++ stuff does it. And it tells you right there when you do the first uh, plus, then, I, then it knows that the, the type is coming because it's annotated in the code, but it doesn't know what to do as, as a calculation result for that. Yes? Would be good to have a default for plus? Sorry? Would be good to have a default for plus in which um, you return the same type? Yes. Um, because it's a typical thing. I, I have an idea that, that there would be some more interactive kind of editing of the config file. So it could give you suggestions. Mm -hmm. But so far, what I have to do is I have to manually write the config file and write into the fact that test type plus test type is some other type because I said so just to make the error messages a bit more interesting. Because now if I rerun the tool and I only rerun the, the propagation tool, I don't have to analyze your code again because you only changed the config file. <coughs> now it shows the error for the second plus. And it tells you that my other whatever type plus test type cannot be added together because it realized from the config file and it also tells you with some broken, it cannot show you contents of the config file in the diagnostic, but that's technical detail, that you defined it to be that other type. And the first calculation for the first plus succeeded because you defined it. And now the problem is in the second uh, plus. So you go back to the config file, you go ahead and say, you define this other operation. And we have a shorthand commutative colon true in the YAML, which means auto define the other way around, basically, just to limit the verbosity a little bit. And now if you rerun the tool, it will tell you that x2 should be that result. So we achieved what we wanted, at least for ints, because this is exactly what we wanted for the propagation to tell me exactly which variables change. And um, I do not have much of the rewriting logic working right now, so that's not on the slides. But from this data, it's imaginable that we could generate rewrites in the code. Clank has a lot of library for that. And, in the, and once it finished iterating, it realizes that there are no more changes. Um, why are there no more changes? There are no more changes because I also haven't implemented the return expression yet in this version. Yeah, it's, I had a lot of other things to do, unfortunately. But I have, I have screenshots of the old version. I can show you that as well. So this is the new infrastructure with the binary serialization and all this kind of, we want to be more optimal on the runtime kind of stuff. You know, you don't want to wait an hour if you click something in the IDE. But previously, as I said, there was a version of the tool that did not scale well, but did work for more stuff. And version control to the rescue, I was able to get it back from my repository and rebuild it and, and create the screenshots because one time we did lose some version that we should have had to rerun for some analysis. <coughs> so we go back to this, this very weird example. Now I put the annotation somewhere else. Okay, so it's now on the arc C just to show that parameter passing and everything else we had a version for. Um, the, the binary was scored a bit differently, but you know, you put the annotation in there, you just tell the tool to go, and it shows you that for the changes in the main CPP, um, you gave effectively type something over to a library function. So that library function should also be refactored, okay. And then it does nothing more because the main CPP is saturated and reached the fixed point for now. Now I can run the tool for the lipsits for the other translation unit because it's put stuff in the header. It will realize that the calc function should also return this test type because there is a return of the refactored value in there. And then it can also, just for, for the show, it can detect that you are doing some other undefined operation with a plus. Um, 
And if you define this operation in a config file, uh, it, it will be able to move further and change the mean, change, so not change, sorry, add this refactoring marker on other variables. It will um, put the change into the header and keep it in sync with the definition file. So both attributes appear in both places. <coughs> And then libcpp also saturated. So now I have from main into lib, and now lib returns something that has to be refactored. So naturally next, I have to run it on the main CPP to get this result. And now from the header, it realizes that, so it's here in the header, because it wrote into the header. So this changed your code with these attributes over and over and over and over again. Um, it realized is that cork returns a test type. So now the X variable is created from a test type. So it should also be a test type. And then immediately without rewriting, it goes further in the propagation and realizes that you did not define the operation properly. Because once again, I have um, test type plus test type undefined, which I'm adding to a test type and shows you a warning. It just named a bit differently. So, I'm very happy about that inlining feature. So let's just, let me show you that, that summary kind of part. So, a bit different example, and this time I'm, I'm letting go of the header file. Let's just say that calc is an identity function. It's just a stupidly named identity function. Let's inline it. I don't want calc to be changed. I want it to be transparent and inlined. And it does that. It also can diagnose you that it realized that whatever comes in as the first parameter will be the returned type. So it doesn't change it, but it transparently tells you that summary applied has been calculated to return the first argument, blah, 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 blah. X should be test type as well. And I, I, I'm, I, I'm not cheating here. This, this works. And then of course, because you did not define the operation of adding them together, it shows you the error. And if you define the operation of adding them together, then it will also move further and do some very weird thing that main should be, wait, where is it? Yeah, it tells you that main's return value should be refactored, which is a bit weird because... <laughs> 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 yeah, so maybe maybe it should be hard coded that that main, the global, how is it phrased in the standard these days? I, I have a very I have a few parts in the standard that I really really like the phrasing and that something about main that it not must not be a coroutine it must be in a global fragment it it I don't know the name main otherwise isn't reserved and <laughs> basically yeah we should hard code that. And this all of calling into the header, calling into the other translation unit, I can simulate a build system and, and if I run just one tool, then it should, should see that the header changed, it works off of timestamps like every good build system does, and it just saturates the code for you. So this, this is the old infrastructure, the, the more scalable version did not have this implemented yet. And if I do the same with inlining, then it also happens. It swallows the output messages for, uh, to make sure it doesn't go bad with all the multithreading. But with the inlining, the inline attribute stays there, but the function doesn't get otherwise attributed. <laughs> and it, uh, it, it stops at the error that it couldn't do the, the plus operation here, okay? And with it, I hopefully can say that formally the model looks really great. Um, if the refactored code happens, then we can move back to conventional C++ and everyday compilers, and they will prevent doing an operation you did not uh, intend to do. Because previously it made you realize that you can divide, let's say you can divide What's that? Distance over time to get speed. Am I right? But if you then try to divide that speed with color, 
then it will be an error for every C++ compiler. And of course, as much time I have, I'm, I'm trying to work out all the scalability issues. But there are a lot of weird constructs in C++ where it's still a design question how to handle them. For example, this whole let's refactor the, the type parameter of a vector. And going back to the previous question of um, where attributes can appear. Mm -hmm. There was a question like that. So in Clang, there are several kinds of, of attributes and there is declaration attribute and type attribute. And I don't know, it's a whole, or, whole uh, set of uh, phrases, but by definition, as far as I know, this, this last case, you cannot put an attribute on that int inside the template parameter, template argument, type template argument, basically. So maybe we will have a bit more argument saying this std vector int named dogs, uh, bracket, bracket, or what, what's that? Square, square, fictive type template argument one, first type parameter is dog or cat or whatever. So I think the best is to first shoot for all the C features like char star and array to pointer decay and all that kind of stuff. And let's leave the C plus, the very C plus plus stuff to the end because from experience, stuff that is written in C++ already start from a, a much, let's say a much more elaborate um, part. So if, if you have your own types in the program, like color, then you will use it consistently. And even within C++ code, the bad part is what's also expressible in C, all the ints and char stars and, and all the stuff like that. And that's the end of the slideshow, so I'm, I'm ready for questions, yes? <laughs> Thank you. The other problem with arrays is that when you start working with or any other structure is that uh, then if you access the pointer, you have to propagate the pointer by mm -hmm. um, some other beast. Yes, um, so a variable that is a pointer is and just another declaration. So if I say fictive type cat, object star whatever buffer, then um, as long as the, so as long as I stop converting from pointer to non-pointer, which is hopefully the compiler already does for me, I can basically keep the star there and just move from object star to cat star. The, interesting part, so which is the interesting part, which is the worst of these languages, which type? Stuff. Sorry? Stuff. Um, yes, something even worse. At least you can't plus plus avoid star. What can you plus plus? Char star. star, of course, yes. Char star, is it one character? Is it, you see a char star, is it single character somewhere which the type should mean? Is it an array of characters which is a properly null terminated string? Or is it some random array that you will just cast, reinterpret, cast, and stuff like that? So, char star is horrible. Mm -hmm. Yes? So, the problem with arrays. I, I know the, the work in progress. What's the largest code base that you've been able to apply your tool to and see reasonable results? Um, I have a few go to tool. I have a few go to projects that we all test our static analysis uh, tools on. Um, I did try it on Apache Xerxes, an XML parser, and we have a tool called Code Compass, which is a web based, Clang based code navigator thingy. Um, that, that I also used to, to try with strings and URLs and stuff like that. So, so not on LLVM itself, uh, most of the, the examples that we have is, is on the toy level, like few files, 
just to make sure that we exercise all the language elements. So, so how, long, how long before I can use this on my computer? <laughs> well, if I have to keep working on it all myself, then I don't know, two years? <laughs> Um, I, I hope to at least somehow get some, some RFCs going on the LLVM mailing list about this. So, because within the tool, I actually re-implementing a lot of the magic of the compiler. Like I have to understand this is a binary operator call that has this token, two subtrees of this type, that type, etc. So I, I'm simulating a compiler inside the compiler, basically. And, and kind of kind of follow up, but almost, but not mm -hmm. every, it's actually a separate question, but um, the, so I thought earlier that you had said something about being able to have the annotation be bound to the type without having to type it over and over again. But I kept seeing you putting the annotation everywhere. Um, because the old tool, so, so this is, um, this is the old infrastructure. The old infrastructure worked by actually putting the annotation into the code and in the next iteration running the compiler over again. So it's, it's you know, just another parsing, like as if you did all this by hand and just run the, stu run the tool from scratch. And that's why it didn't scale. So we moved over to a newer infrastructure where um, large screenshots make the, co make the computer slow. Um, one moment, I'm, over, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. Uh, hmm. It's moving slower in the reverse deck. Okay, here. So um, basically, until so until I reach an error or until I reach the fixed point, it gets stored in these binary files that isn't meant for human consumption. This is like the the BMI, the module stuff. So so the idea is that. Up until the tool can go, it, it does it, let's say, in memory, just this time in memory is at least stored somewhere, so if we crash, we can restart. And then once we reach the point where we can either put in more annotations, so you want to commit it further, like come back next day to continue this work, or you can just go ahead and refactor the code. And so have you, th have you thought, I know that this is a lot of work to do these annotations and do this stuff, have you thought of trying to use something like, um, instead of doing all of that at compile time to mm -hmm. figure out these things, I mean, having to inter like implement your own compiler mm -hmm. almost, use something like libclang to annotate and use the annotations to actually then generate strong type things. Then you can use that to test and check what mixes and matches with actual code that compiles. Um, this is using libclang under the hood. Uh, back in the previously, I, I did not find a good way to emit custom attributes into, into a code, so I had to write my own. Maybe it changed. Um, the problem is that changing the, the so, so using libclang in a way that I create types and mutate the syntax tree like destructively. I did try it at first. No, no, but no. I wasn't. I wasn't talking uh, about actually mutating uh, the syntax tree using libclang to read the read the stuff and then actually generate C plus plus code that then you can use. That way you don't have to keep modifying the the, the the tree, right? You just generate the the replacement code to 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 use. Oh, that that will be the that will be the the end goal. That that will be the end goal to to create the replacement code with some good tooling. Uh, there was a question there first. Um, what does the convergence curve on this look like? Because every time you uh, expand some annotations, you're going to have more annotations to um, strip. So like, does it look like a sigmoid or an exponential? Um, well, I hope that eventually it starts going down because, you know, you reach a, a saturation. Um, I'm doing everything I can to to, to only rerun calculations that are needed. So internally, the tool keeps track of, of which files changed, within which files. Um, I think it's not going down to the function level. It's more like down to the, the, the outermost scope, so either a namespace or a class. 
and then when rerunning the the calculation it so at the bottom here after so it's not on the not on the picture but but towards the end of the file i have a serialized view of all the propagations and i can index into it so i don't think it will blow up too much because eventually you will likely reach a point where you sink away your value and that sinking of the value will be a kind of forward progress that comes outside of your project you will print it you will write it onto the socket you will i don't know so so usually there are all these things and and when i was doing this in hand in in apache zergsys uh the I, I i always saw that you know eventually it just gets stored as a raw value to be printed out as an XML. Um, you had a question? No, it's time. Oh, it's time. Okay. okay. All right. Well, then, thank you very much. Thank you.